Hi everybody, Chris here from the Adler Planetarium. I am the collections manager here. The Adler's historic artifact collection contains objects from all over the world. Asia, Europe, the Americas, you name it, every region we probably have an object from it. There are a few areas that we're a little underrepresented in, but by and large we're pretty happy with the diversity of our collection. One of our big strengths here is our collection of historic astrolabes. Now astrolabes were early handheld uh, analog computers from the Middle Ages. They were predominantly used for telling the time, using the stars, but they could also be used for things like surveying and triangulation. We're standing here in an exhibit within the Adler Planetarium called Astronomy and Culture, which deals very heavily with various cultures and religions influencing astronomical study and instrument making throughout history. Behind me, you can see quite a few of the Adler's historic astrolabes, some of the best on display behind me. So let's take a look at some of those. As best historians can tell, the design and concept of the astrolabe was invented in Hellenistic Greece in the 2nd or 3rd century BCE. From there, the design and the concept traveled to the Middle East in the Islamic world, where the science and construction of the astrolabes was really perfected. Some of the most beautiful and striking examples of astrolabes in the Adler's collection come from this region. From the Middle East, the design and concept of the astrolabes traveled east into Asia. In fact, in Lahore, Pakistan in the 12th and 18th centuries, it became a center of instrument making and scientific study. But the design of the astrolabe also traveled through North Africa by Islamic scholars, scientists, and religious figures. By the 11th and 12th centuries, we began to see improved astrolabes reappearing in Western Europe through the Iberian Peninsula, what's now present-day Spain and Portugal. Today, I really want to show off two specific astrolabes from our historic collection. One from Spain that really showcases the influence of Middle Eastern and North African culture on the Iberian Peninsula, and one from Northern England. They're both on display currently, so let's go take them out of the cases before we can look at them in the conservation lab. Before we delve into what makes each of the two pieces that we've removed from the cases really unique, let's talk quickly about how an astrolabe actually works. Now I won't get too detailed here, as there are plenty of videos and tutorials out there that show the intricacies of how an astrolabe works, but I do want to give you a quick overview of the parts of an astrolabe, as well as one of the most basic uses, telling time. Now each astrolabe, regardless of where they're made, have a few basic parts in common. First is the large metal disc used for housing all the other parts. This is called the matter, and is the part highlighted in blue on the graphic you see. Second are the plates, or tin pins. These are individual plates that represent the portion of the celestial sphere seen from a specific latitude. Since stars can appear at various heights in the sky from different latitudes, most astrolabes have multiple tin pins, or plates, so you can swap them out if you travel and change latitudes. The final main part of an astrolabe is this beautifully constructed carved star chart on the front of the astrolabe, called a reet. It should be marked in yellow on the graphic you see here. Each little point on the reet represents a specific star, and the reet sits on top of the tin pins. It rotates across the tin pins so you can line up your specific star with the coordinates you view it at. So here we are in the conservation lab with the two pieces that we took out of the cases earlier. Let's go ahead and take a look at each because both are very different. We'll start with this one. This piece is from around 1240 in Spain or on the Iberian Peninsula. It was made by a man named Muhammad ibn Yusuf ibn Hatim. Uh, my Arabic is not, I'm not fluent in Arabic, so you'll have to excuse any mistranslations there. But this piece really represents the ideas and the culture of Islam that came through North Africa into the Iberian Peninsula in the 12th and 13th centuries. Islamic scholars and scientists really brought these things and instruments and ideas with them uh, up that way into Western Europe. There's obviously Arabic characters written all over this piece, and it really reflects the modern Middle Ages thinking, scientific thinking of the time. Now there's a reason that the Middle East becomes a center of scientific and astronomical discovery in the Middle Ages, and a large part of that is because of religion. Astrolabes, as we talked about earlier, obviously help you tell the time, and one of the main reasons that Islamic scientists and instrument makers perfect the astrolabe in the Middle Ages is to help them tell the time for morning prayers. Uh, it's obviously not the only reason that uh, ast astronomy and scientific instruments are perfected in the Middle East, but it is one of the big reasons. Now this piece has 36 individual star pointers on it. Each, at the base of each one is a silver knob. A lot of those have fallen off over time. Some of them haven't. Uh, some of them have just broken off over time, but some are still there. Uh, and so they point to very specific latitudes on five separate tin pins or plates within the astrolabe. On the reverse side, you'll see your typical information that is found on an, on an astrolabe at this time period, which is the calendar, 
as well as a shadow square here to help you figure out the time based on the elevation of the stars. So let's take a look at this piece now. This astrolabe is obviously a lot larger than the previous piece. We believe it's a little later in date as well, from about the 14th century, uh, either from England or Northern Europe. The history of it is a little nebulous, but we're pretty sure from our research that it belonged to King Edward III of England at one point. Uh, he gave this piece as a gift to two prominent banking families in Northern Italy, uh, in Florence specifically, uh, as repayment for the loans that they gave him to fight his wars against Scotland and France. Now, both of those families in Northern Italy experienced some financial hardships and had to sell this piece to another family in Italy, the Strazzi family. A number of objects in the Adler's collection are from the Strazzi family, which is why we believe that that's the history of this object. There's a number of unique features on this astrolabe that support our research hypothesis. The first is this decorative element here called a quatrefoil. Now, really, it's a representation of a four-leaf clover, otherwise known as a king's crown in 14th century Europe. Uh, specifically, it's the symbol used to represent King Edward III of England, uh, partially on his coronation, but throughout his reign as well one hint as to why this belonged to King Edward III. Another decorative piece here that is a little bit of a giveaway is the zoomorphic representation on the star pointer of this dog. It represents three individual star pointers, two for its ears, one for its tongue, and these are very typical of early European Middle Ages uh, star pointer, zoomorphic depictions of star pointers. This astrolabe also has 41 individual star pointers on it which is substantially more than your typical astrolabe, which has around 25. It also includes five timpans made from a silver-plated copper-zinc alloy. Uh, this style is actually really unique for early European uh, astrolabes, and we're not really sure if they are later editions or Italian editions uh, after King Edward III gifted this piece to, to, to Florence. The inscriptions and lines on the plates indicate that they were used to find the time in Italian hours. Uh, which was divided into 24 equal hours beginning at sunset as well. And that's the history of these two pieces, uh, two of our more important and interesting pieces in the Adler's Astrolabe collection. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, stay tuned for more videos, uh, behind the scene videos and object history videos coming up in the next couple of weeks and we'll see you soon.